Hi, we're the Mind Body Couple. I'm Tanner Murtaugh. And I'm Anne Hampson. And this podcast is dedicated to helping you unlearn neuroplastic pain and mind body concerns. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Welcome back. We have a commonly asked question that we want to discuss today. Mm -hmm. I feel like I hear this at least a handful of times a week. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So our topic that we want to discuss is do I need to eliminate my stress to eliminate my chronic pain and symptoms? Yeah, and I think you're right, Tanner. Like so many people wonder this. Um, most likely because I think it's very common when we have neuroplastic pain or neuroplastic component to pain to see that stress connector um, that will act either kind of flare pain up when there's stress or the lack of stress, pain might kind of reduce. Yeah, and so for pain and physical symptoms, we talk about this a lot mm-hmm. where, you know, stress has an impact on it. Yeah. People put this together uh, a, lot, a lot of times far before... They come to a mind-body approach. People Mm -hmm. understand there's a link. Yeah. But is all stress bad? Hmm. And the answer is actually definitely not. Yeah. Stress is going to be a part of life. It is going to be near impossible to always be calm and at ease. And we'll dive into why that is. But that can't be the goal. Mm-hmm. I think like, and, and like I said, as we dive in, we'll talk about this more, but I think understanding that stress connector is important. Understanding what to do with stress is important, but that's right. We don't want to always view it as wrong or bad. Similarly to our symptoms, we don't want to view those as wrong or bad all the time either. Yeah. And when I was healing, this is something that I came to where I was just trying to eliminate as much stress from my life as possible. What did that look like for you then? I was doing all this Mm self-care and, you know, (laughs) constantly getting enough sleep, mindfulness, somatic practices, qigong. Like I was just layering it all on. That sounds pretty good to me, though, Tanner. I feel like people listening would be like, yeah. (laughs) It's, It's good, but the reality is... At that point in my life, we didn't have kids, for example, Mm -hmm. and life was a little bit slower paced for us. Yeah. So it was easier, but the reality is stress is a part of life. Mm. And what I talk about with people, and this is a really important distinction, I feel like this could have been a topic in and of itself, but the difference between nervous system regulation versus nervous system dysregulation. Because this is really important when we discuss this of, you know, do I need to eliminate my stress? Is all stress bad? Right. It comes down to a regulated nervous system versus a dysregulated nervous system. So a dysregulated nervous system, I want to be clear with people, it is a prolonged, a prolonged state of fight, flight, freeze, or shutdown. And so if stress is a trigger and maybe kind of can lead to a dysregulated nervous system, Mm -hmm. I think it would make sense for people to think, okay, then I must eliminate stress. Yeah. And that's the idea is people are like, okay, I can't be in fight, flight, freeze, or shutdown. Right. Which is just a fancier way to say stress. So I'm going to try and eliminate stress as much as possible. Yeah. But it's important to understand that a dysregulated nervous system means it's prolonged. Okay. So stuck. Yeah. Where a regulated nervous system, and this is something that many people are talking about nowadays and for good reason, it doesn't mean you're always just calm Mm -hmm. or relaxed. Yeah. That's not what nervous system regulation is. Like we want people to have more access to the ventral vagal, safe, connected, calm state. Yeah. But your nervous system wasn't meant to function that way. All the time. Okay, so the goal to always be there isn't realistic. No. When we talk about nervous system regulation, Deb Dana talks about this a lot. It's flexible. So it means you could go into fight or flight Mm. or stress. You could even go into a shutdown free state and you could come back out with more ease. Okay. 
so that it's flexible. You can shift between feeling safe and calm, being in fight or flight or mobilize, and being shut down. You can shift with more ease. Where with dysregulation, what happens to people is they get these cycles of activation going on. And I've had many cycles of activation personally. What will happen is people will face a challenge and they'll fly into fight or flight Mm -hmm. and remain there for days or months. Ah, okay. So that's the key of noticing, Mm -hmm. am I often stuck in fight or flight? And is my stress contributing to that? Well, fight or flight is stress. Okay. It is stress. Like, that's what it comes down to. Um, stress is like this. Or like the trigger, general, like the activation. There, there can, yeah, the oh, I know what you mean now. Yeah. yeah. Like, there can be this stressful activation. And if someone was regulated, mm-hmm. they might get mobilized or go into fight or flight and then shift back out nice and easily. Ah, okay. But for people, what happens with toxic stress, that's what we mean by nervous system dysregulation. Say, you know, you get a rude email from your boss and you fly into fight or flight and you're there for the rest of the week. Okay, so that would be the activating trigger. Maybe someone might pinpoint that as like the stressor. Yeah. Putting someone in fight or flight. But then, yes, not knowing how to kind of step out of that, getting stuck in that. Stuck. Exactly. Okay. And so it's not about necessarily eliminating the rude boss email, even though we all want to. Yeah. It's about flexibility stepping out of fight or flight. Yes. It's the ability. And that's what a lot of that we focus on at our clinic, mm-hmm. that we focus on in our approach is we want to give people the ability for their nervous system to be flexible. So I'm going to get sciencey in a second here. Okay. But another example of like a cycle of activation for people is they face a stressor, mm-hmm. okay? Rude email from the boss. Let's mm-hmm. use that one. They it's go, funny because Tanner's my boss. <laughs> Sometimes I, I interpret send, his emails uh, as rude, but maybe it's because we're married and I'm like blinded by... You're blinded. By Let's go with our that. Marriage. I like that. Let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry, go on. But what will happen is you get the rude email. Mm-hmm. Maybe Anne got a rude email for me. <laughs> or I'm perceiving it as rude. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter. Right. (laughs) You go under fight or flight. This is another cycle of activation. And then you're stuck in fight or flight for days. And then your system just collapses and shuts down into dorsal. Uh, Like that's another type of cycle of activation. Yeah. For other people, they'll alternate, like oscillate between fight or flight shutdown. It's like they're just switching. Okay. That's also this cycle of activation. And what happens with cycles of activation for people is they have low vagal tone. Okay, so explain that again. Sciencey term of mine, but when we talk about vagal tone, and I know we've talked about it on this podcast before, this is like how well basically your vagus nerve, your parasympathetic system is functioning. And so if you have low vagal tone, what happens is it doesn't become flexible. It becomes rigid, your system. Mm. So you get into these cycles of activation where you're stuck in fight or flight or you're stuck in shutdown. And if you have low vagal tone or poor vagal tone, you're much more likely to develop chronic pain and symptoms. Okay. So again, maybe a little bit of side note, how do we increase vagal tone? Yeah. We'll, I'll get there in, in a few minutes here because right. I know that's the question right. everyone wants to know. <laughs> but it's important to understand this when we talk about... Do you need to eliminate stress to reduce your chronic pain or symptoms? No, you you definitely don't. Do you need to eliminate prolonged toxic stress? Yes. Okay, so that's what's been in my mind. So what about the person whose boss is emailing them rude emails constantly throughout the day? Yeah. What about that scenario? And And it's hard because we can't all just like leave and quit our job. But I have worked with people where... You know, if they're working in a toxic workplace and maybe people listening relate to that, that's toxic stress. And we can do as much regulation as we can. And that can be supportive when we talk about how to increase vagal tone. That'll be helpful no matter what the situation. But it is hard because that's these toxic, stressful triggers that are being thrown at you every single day. Mm -hmm you know, five or six days a week at work. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot to deal with. And you're right. And we're going to talk about this at the end, give you some key points to take away. Mm. But yes, like we have to consider like, what are the triggers that are just causing this toxic stress in my life? Mm -hmm. 
that needs to be dealt with a lot of the time. Totally. So it's kind of a bit of a balance of like, can we flexibly move um, and regulate our nervous system kind of in the face or in the experience of stress? And then maybe what are stressors that we need to take a more hard, honest look at that are kind of impacting us as well? Exactly. And so when we talk about this, we want to talk about how to increase vagal tone. Yes. High vagal tone. Tell us how to. High, high. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the practices are actually quite simplistic. There's, there's not, you know, this big fancy technique that's just going to increase your vagal tone. Um, it's consistency to some degree. But the benefit here with high vagal tone is chronic pain and symptoms have been shown to reduce in people with high vagal tone, mm-hmm. which makes sense because they can face a stressor and they can shift back out to a calm and collected state after. Mm-hmm. I have to say this because I think on my podcast we talk about like my love of horses, but this is a really great example. Horses do this very naturally. Well, they'll they'll get into like this fight or flight mode. They'll be spooked, and then then they, re- they realize there's no danger. And boom, they just kind of shift out very quickly, very naturally back to this kind of different state. You see that a lot with animals of the, where they're, they're in, they go into that fight or flight for whatever reason to protect themselves, but they don't get stuck there. Yeah. High vagal tone. Yeah. High vagal tone <laughs> we, horses. So we can learn from them. So, you know, increasing vagal tone, I don't want to spend too much time on this, um, but there's there's lots of different ways. Mindfulness, meditation. Okay, and why does that increase vagal tone? You know, some of this, the understanding, like the mechanism behind why it increases vagal tone, they're not really sure on some of these things. There's reason, like if you do like breath work or Mm -hmm. yoga or qigong, like you are more in your body. It is a very calming practice. It helps to regulate yourself consistently. So at most of these on here, things like mindfulness, breath work, nature, qigong, somatic practices, cold water, they strengthen that ventral vagal state and they give you more access to it. Okay, so is it fair to say again, learning how to shift into that ventral vagal state with like whatever kind of works for you, the more we practice that, yeah. the easier it is to access that when we're in that state or fight or flight and yeah, or in the face of stressors. It's kind of a rewiring of the brain and nervous system. Mm-hmm. It, Our nervous system, it to some degree, gravitates towards what's familiar. Yes. What's been useful in the past. So it's if it's been useful and you felt safer when you're in fight or flight Mm. in the past, and that was a useful survival mechanism, your nervous system basically codes it. And it's like, that was really useful. And so it just over and over and over again brings you there. But we're also giving you experiences with some of this stuff, like breath work, mindfulness, qigong, yoga, whatever it is that you're utilizing. There's so many ways to increase vagal tone. What we're doing is we're giving our nervous system more access to ventral. Mm. And then, in my opinion, it just naturally starts to gravitate there more often. Well, and I like thinking of it this way. And and something that I talk about with people is practice this maybe when there isn't a lot of, like, triggering stressors. So say the stressors are at your workplace. Practice this when you're not at your workplace of, like, okay, can I be activated and then shift into ventral? And then the more we have that foundation— the easier it might be to do that in that more high stressor environment like the workplace. And you hit on something that's really key here is that, and that's why I explained nervous system regulation versus dysregulation at the beginning. Because what people will do is they're like, oh yeah, like I need to increase vagal tone. Here's all these things. So they're trying to force themselves to stay calm all the time. These are actually the skills you use to deal with dysregulation in the future Mm -hmm. or deal with difficult emotions or deal with stress. Yes. Like, for example, like my, I snap into doing some type of breathing practice while I'm dealing with difficult emotions. Mm. I'm not avoiding it and trying to force myself to be calm. Okay. I'm using I, these skills yeah. to deal with difficult states of my system or emotions. And that's a good distinction because I think people listening might think, well, you are trying to force yourself out of that to be calm by doing mm-hmm. the breathing. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a very, important distinction that we didn't actually plan on talking about today, but here we are, you know, with this, like all those regulation skills you're using to increase vagal tone, Mm -hmm. 
they lay a platform for you to have more of an ability to approach things that are un- unpleasant or uncomfortable, move through them mm. with more ease and shift back up to a calm state. Uh, but if you're feeling anger and you just sit and do breathing and try to avoid your anger, that can dysregulate you more. Yes. And so it's important to acknowledge the feelings that you're feeling, that what the stressors are triggering. For instance, like the anger, and, and almost validate that a little bit and then work on those skills. We don't want to completely avoid it or just kind of invalidate yeah. and pretend those emotions aren't there. Exactly. And so there's two things here. Part of it is, you know, you want to increase vagal tone, like mm-hmm. having some type of practice. Um, some great studies I read are even like singing or chanting or humming. Work Which really, I feel really like well. Tanner does often. I, I hear him humming around the house oh, yeah. and singing, and uh, I don't really hear you chanting. You got to take advantage of these things. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have a whole little mini section of our course just devoted to that because I, right, right. I think it's like such a easy kind of fun way sure that's been shown in research to increase vagal tone mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so there's a lot of ways you can do this but part of this is you know committing to some type of daily practice mm-hmm. and then look it doesn't have to be singing and chanting no. that's not really a mind but i think it's important to have an open mind to trying something a bit different yeah there's lots of things i have a great you know if people need a summary i have like a vagal tone um video on YouTube mm-hmm. that they can go watch. I just go through different things that can increase vagal tone. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's just picking a few things, right? Like just being in nature. For Anne, your your vagus nerve is toning every time you're with Casper in nature. Uh-huh. Casper's her horse, sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Casper the horse. Well, and it's actually interesting because I think we've been going through this lately. I haven't been able to get out to see him, but it's a huge piece of regulation for me. And we both know that. And when I'm, you know, doing that regularly, um, I feel naturally more regulated. I feel safer. I feel kind of like I'm able to handle stressors better. Um, and so, Tanner, you need to support me to go right, is I, what I'm trying to tell her while I'm listening. Supporting you. You're going today. I am going today. Yeah. Um, but it's knowing, okay, if this helps, if you, if there's something that helps you shift, of like, how can we implement that into the day? So it's yeah. not like... How can I get rid of all stressors? It's how can I implement these things or activities that help regulate the nervous system um, and make us move more flexibly? Exactly. So that's part of the puzzle here. The, the other part that we touched on in the beginning is what are the triggers? What are the triggers mm-hmm. that are causing you to be dysregulated yeah. and have low vagal tone? And some of these we can't control. Uh, no. like I think about our own kids like premature birth does this mm-hmm. to a to a child's nervous system. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of our, if if you haven't listened to those episodes, both of our kids were very premature. Some of those, and you know, we do lots of breathing. I do some chanting with Louie, actually. Mm-hmm. So we're doing things with our kids. Some of these factors you can't control, but something like a toxic workplace, that's going to have an effect on dysregulating your system and you having this low vagal tone. Well, and yeah, and so that's back to that idea of like, okay, do we need to take a hard look uh, what is happening in our life because that's right so we want it's not necessarily about stress or stressors and getting rid of it but sometimes we do need to shift our lifestyle a little bit yeah. um to kind of not have toxic stress like tanner's saying um to help kind of shift the way we interact with our world sometimes that's exactly it there's both there's you know what are the triggers that are causing this dysregulation mm-hmm. and then what are the daily practices that we can do to just benefit our nervous system and increase vagal tone yeah we need both um and it's just thinking about triggers that's why lots of people and this is hard work to do but processing trauma Mm -hmm. that trauma causes chronic nervous system dysregulation Mm -hmm. low vagal tone we know that and so untreated trauma can have a real effect on our system going through and getting the right treatment that works for you for trauma super key super key to regulating the nervous system more over time like that's a trigger from long ago that's still affecting you yeah so it's everyday things of course like what are the toxic things in your life Mm -hmm. that are causing this Mm -hmm. but it's also things from your past yeah are there things i need to work through to deal with this totally and it can also be simple as simple as like and you mentioned daily things tanner it can also be as simple as like okay 
like, what does my daily routine look like? Is it one of intensity? Mm -hmm. Um, Am I creating more of that fight or flight kind of stress reaction just in how I'm operating? Yes, that's important too. Like when we had the two types of lifestyles we Mm -hmm. talked about a few episodes ago, you know, if we're falling into one of those types of lifestyles and living in a certain way, that's not just healthy stress that's toxic stress that is causing chronic nervous system dysregulation totally and sometimes it is then back to that okay how do i slow down where do i make those shifts and it's not necessarily you know never being intense again it's but sometimes it is shifting our way of being a little bit too yeah and that's something i had to learn over time because like i we talked about at the beginning i came to that conclusion that you know eliminating my stress was the only way I was going to be out of pain. Yeah. But later on, after I healed, I got stressed. The pain came on. And I had to learn to deal with it in a different way. Mm-hmm. I had to learn, you know, what's the difference between healthy stress and toxic stress? And what are regulating factors for my system so I can flexibly not stay in this, like, fight-or-flight state constantly? Yeah. And those were things that I had to kind of get sorted as I went. Was something else that you had to do, Tanner, was kind of learn not to necessarily fear stress. Because I think when Mm -hmm. we realize stress is a trigger, we view it as bad. And then we start fearing it of like, oh, my gosh, this is going to flare me up. Yeah, people have that. And then they avoid. Yes. And one of the most key components of this whole approach that overarchs everything is approach versus avoid. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm all for strategic avoidance sometimes, like useful avoidance when things are too much for us to tolerate. Yeah. But the way we heal is approaching. Yes. So it comes down to we approach life. We approach our pain and symptoms. We approach emotions. We approach stress. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, yeah, we have to actually make changes. So it's not all about approaching Mm because sometimes we need to approach maybe instead making a change. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty key in all of this is approaching versus avoiding and that also comes down to our stress yep so things to keep in mind to reduce stress's impact on your pain or symptoms we've talked about lots of things mm-hmm. in this episode you know the first thing is taking time to notice how stress is impacting your pain or symptoms what situations is yeah. it typically? That's different person to person. Yes. I've had people with financial stress. That's the main thing that triggers their symptoms. Right. I've had, you know, people with just family stress, with just work stress. So mm-hmm. there's stress is, can be sneaky in the different ways it affects it. And it's also looking at, is this healthy stress that I need to learn to approach? Mm. Or is this toxic prolonged stress that is causing chronic nervous system dysregulation. Right. Because how we deal with one of those is really important. So one thing is, as we talked about, changing your reaction to healthy stress, Mm -hmm. to normal stress that we're going to deal with. That's where we actually need to approach. We have lots of episodes on dealing with emotions, how to approach them. That's vital here. If you're dealing with healthy, typical stress or emotions, like we need to approach those. Mm -hmm. That's how we deal with those. Mm -hmm. But it's also taking time to notice, like one of the factors that are making me have like poor vagal tone and identifying some of those triggers and those factors that maybe currently you're dealing with or from farther back, and then putting into practice some things that are going to increase vagal tone. Mm So there's a mix. There's a mix of what we want people to keep in mind here. Yeah, totally. And if you're kind of thinking of like, okay, where do I start in terms of like increasing vagal tone um, or learning how to flexibly shift is something I always talk about people is learning just to kind of lean into breathing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great thing. I know a lot of people are like, oh, breathing. Um, but it can be hugely powerful in kind of calming down the system, creating some safety, easing a bit of stress or anxiety, um, and teaching us to pause. And so I think that's a great place to start playing around. Yes. The breathing's key. Mm-hmm. Also on the YouTube channel, there's a whole free like breathing practice mm-hmm. on there that, yep. you know, if you don't know what to do. 
uh, that can be pretty key to check out. Yep. And you're right. I, I hear that a lot mm-hmm. with people uh, breathing. And it's funny, like early on, even as a therapist in my career, I would say the same. I'd be like, oh, breathing. Yeah. Um, but it's so powerful if we start using it um, with intentionality. Yeah. And consistency. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's like people are like, ah, oh, breathing. But it comes down to, are you doing the breathing, though? Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I used to be like, ah, oh, whatever, breathing. Yeah, yeah. But then I started doing the breathing consistently. And, you know, months would go by and be like, wow, I'm way more regulated. Right. I'm way <laughs> like more something to able that. to shift it's out true. of, like, this yeah. dysregulated fight or flight. So there's there's a huge benefit. Don't make it complicated. If you hate breathing, don't do breathing. There are so many things. Mm-hmm. Go sing and hum in the shower. Yeah, yeah. Go out in nature. Yeah. Do cartwheels. <laughs> uh, I don't know if cartwheels increase bail. <laughs> uh, it might. Like, it's, it's movement. Move, it's movement. It, it feels good. Yeah. It could be freeing for some, not yeah. for others. But <laughs> some, some light, playful movement yeah. has been shown to increase bail. Ve- Increase vagal tone, so. But it is about, like, playing around with kind of, like, what works for you. Um, what do you notice when you're doing different activities um, and trying things out? Exactly. Yeah. So, this is our episode on stress. Mm-hmm. And if you need to eliminate it or not. Yep. Really comes down to the type of stress you're dealing with. Yeah. So, I hope this episode was helpful for everyone. And we'll talk to you all next week. Talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. If you want to book in a session with one of our therapists, you can go to our website at painpsychotherapy.ca. You can also follow us on Instagram at painpsychotherapy, where me and Anne are posting content daily and are there to respond to your comments. Also, check out our YouTube channel, which is named Tanner Murtaugh MSW RSW.